Can I get everybody's attention? I definitely cannot scream. What's up? Oh yeah, no worries. So, I got a lot of ground to cover. Um, I, I, I get asked a lot about real estate investment and I don't want to speak for all of you, but I'm curious. And you don't even have to throw your hands up for the first part, but I love, me personally, I love when my agents invest. I think that part of being in real estate is, is you know, where we're, we're, we get into this business and this business is obviously about helping people and it's the American dream, home ownership and all of that. But in my mind, I feel like the only way to true wealth and the only way to freedom is real estate investment. Like I really believe that in my heart of hearts. And so when I'm working with an agent and I have them in my office and they tell me that they're thinking about, you know, going into a, an investment property, I light up inside because I feel like what is my job more so than anything else in life when somebody entrusts me with their real estate career, it's to help them grow in life. It's to help them build. It's to help them, you know, do bigger and better things for what they want to accomplish in their world. And so, you know, my hope in this conversation is twofold is one, I hope that I empower you guys to invest in real estate. I really do. I think that that would be an awesome thing if you guys take that you know, out of here and you walk away from today and think to yourself, I could do this. I could invest in real estate and you create a path for it. The second thing is, I hope that you feel more comfortable working with investors because quite frankly, like a lot of us run from investors because we just don't feel comfortable working with investors. We just don't know what to say or what not to say and all of that. Um, so my, my hope for this is those two things are accomplished and I'm going to try my best to get us there. Um, I put this up, I'm going to be stopping quite a bit for water because my voice is shot. I'm not just naturally this raspy. Um, but basically I put this up the last time and I wanted to just explain something. Um, I will be putting up the videos for these events. And I know I didn't the last time and I, I didn't mean to not deliver to you guys. The honest truth is, uh, congratulations are in order. Mario over here <laughs> and his uh, lovely wife, Siobhan, had a beautiful baby boy. So congratulations to you. <clears throat> I, uh, I know we'll get those, those you know, videos back and I'm, I'm not complaining. I really am congratulating you. Um, and you know, while I'm on the topic, I actually also had a, a little baby girl. So Francesca, um, I mean, there's nothing like bringing life into this world. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, I'm going to tell you my story about investment. Cause I think that hopefully it'll, it'll help you guys. Um, the brokers open is the hashtag. I'm going to skip past that. You know, I don't, I don't, again, I don't want to speak for all of you, but I think that when you start talking about money, people get a little weird. You know, it's a little, it's an uncomfortable topic sometimes. And you know, it's, there's, there's a little bit of ego. There's a little bit of vulnerability that goes along with money. And I realized that what I'm about to dive into, and I'm kind of like the, you know, I, I was thinking about Ellen when she was speaking, like she just lays it all on the table. I'm very much that person. Like, I just feel like, let's just talk, let's be real about it. And hopefully we get something out of it. So I'm going to go through some of the investments that I made and my journey of investment in the hopes that you, you pull something out of it. So we are going to talk about money. There's zero ego to this. And I'm going to talk about really what I mean by zero ego. I'm going to, I'm going to actually go into my origin story because I think it tells you a lot about who I am and where I came from. So my origin story um, starts with my parents. Uh, my parents, I would argue that I have the greatest parents in the history of time. Love them to death. I mean, they are such good people. They're such hard workers. I feel blessed. I won the lottery of life when it comes to them. Um, but they grew up extremely poor and <clears throat> dirt poor, you know, standing on lines for food stamp poor. Like they, you know, they did not have means. They just didn't. Uh, they never went to college. They are not in real estate. My mom got her real estate license to help me on my team years ago. Um, but she, you know, they didn't have a real estate background. Uh, they weren't builders. They, you know, they, they didn't have a trust fund. So there was no like money coming to me in any way, shape or form on that front. Um, and quite frankly, they had a limited financial knowledge. Like they didn't have an understanding of how to invest. Like that was like, they were barely, you know, they were trying to get by. They were trying to pay their bills and, you know, and thrive in life and, and provide a good life for us. What they did give me, however, is way more important than the top section. 
they gave me their time, and they did. They, they, were, <clears throat> they did everything possible for me. Uh, love, strong work ethic, that's a big one, and I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, character, I think that they taught me how to be a good person. <clears throat> Shelter, food, clothes, all the, you know, the basic necessities. Advice, and street smarts, they're both from Brooklyn. And you know, I can tell you, I, I was raised in Queens, I, I grew up in New Providence, and that was a big part of who I was, just like knowing how to navigate. So there are other lessons that your parents, or that my parents you know, taught me that were not necessarily taught, but it was observed. And when you think about what I observed, the number one thing that comes to mind is, is the George Washington Bridge. I watched my father take that bridge to work every day and go into the Bronx and go, you know, and then eventually he switched up and he was in, in you know, in the city. Um, but he was, he was getting up at 5.30 in the morning every single day. Like he was, he worked for a contractor. Um, he ran projects for, you know, for uh, large scale construction projects for the New York City Transit Authority. And, you know, he, he basically was a worker, like an unbelievable work ethic. And I saw him do this every single day. And I had a takeaway from that. I realized that what my father was doing was trading time for money. And I saw that and I, you know, I respected it. I respected the fact that he worked his ass off. But I didn't want that. I didn't want to trade time for money. I didn't want to wake up at 5.30 in the morning. That wasn't for me. <clears throat> so number two, what I observed from them is savings. The one thing I got to give them credit on is they, they didn't go out and live above their means. That just wasn't who they were. They saved their money. Like they did what they were supposed to do in terms of making smart financial investments. And I don't mean, I don't even want to say investments so much as putting their money in the bank and not just blowing it on stupid stuff. Number three, they bought homes. I shouldn't even say plural because it was one home at a time. But those homes, those mortgages that they paid were for savings accounts. And they got the appreciation of those homes. And if it wasn't for the homes that they bought and sold through the years, our primary residents, we wouldn't be in the position that they weren't be in the position that they are today. And they are in a pretty good financial position. So that appreciation over time, in some ways saved them from a lot of poor financial decisions that they made. I remember like, you know, my mom, she got, she worked for AT&T. She got a pension or excuse me, she got a buyout and they gave her a lump sum of money and they didn't, they weren't even realizing what they were doing. That's like a financial thing for the future. You know, they were living off of that and she didn't go back to work. She wanted to stay home and help us out. They blew through that whole amount of money because downturns in the market and everything else. And it was like, it was really a stupid use of those funds. But the, the honest truth is, is they didn't know any better. They didn't, they didn't know how to invest in anything. That, that wasn't what they were taught. So I was fortunate enough to go to Seton Hall. I went to Seton Hall University and I was the first in my family to go to college. Um, <coughs> excuse me, which was definitely a big deal. Um, I studied international economics in, at Seton Hall. I also studied in Beijing, China, and uh, in Florence, Italy. So I got this like global perspective of, you know, of the world, of, of the world of, of business and finance and, and economics. And you know, the funny part about it is, is I, I felt like I got a great education, and I did. I got this awesome education. But things that I, my parents always joke around is like, you're the guy who went to college, like you tell us. And it was like, like half the time it were things that like had nothing to do with what I learned in college. It was stuff that, you know, had, you know, that's not what you learn there, but they didn't know any better. It was just like, you know, they always expected me to be more knowledgeable on things because of this higher education. So the long and the short of it is there are things that I did not learn in college. And one of them, as an economics major, a global economics major, how did I not learn that there are four different ways to produce income? I didn't learn that from college. And that was something that I learned from a book, The Cash Flow Quadrant. Now, if you guys have never read that book, awesome book, Change Your Perspective on Money Overnight. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki is the author. So I want to walk you through one quick learning from The Cash Flow Quadrant. So there are four different ways to produce income in life. The first one is an employee. If you're an employee, you have a job. That's the way it works, you have a job. The next one is self-employed. You own a job. A lot of people think that they're self-employed. By the way, in real estate, we're self-employed. Like, you know, and we can look at it differently depending on you get on the other side of this, you know, this quadrant in a second, but we're self-employed. And you could treat it like you're self-employed and just basically work that job every day and do everything you possibly can. And 
quite frankly, that's what it is. It's a job. On the top right corner, you got a business owner. Business owner is, for those of you, and I'm not saying everybody should do this. Like clearly there are people, I'm gonna use Ellen as an example, who does not have a team. Like there are people that are solo agents that run their business like a business. But a lot of times we find the business owners in this business are people that are our teams. And the reason why is you own a system and people work for you. Now, the leap from the left side to the right side is dramatic. And I want to explain why leverage. So every one of us in here, we have the same limitations to our day to day life. We all have 24 hours in the day. We all have to sleep. We all have to eat. We all have to take a shower. We all have to do certain things that just take up time in our day. And when we are on the left side of this equation, like we're basically limited by that 24 hour period. When we move to the right side of that equation, well now you have more than 24 hours in a day <clears throat> because you have other people that are working for you and through your system, you're creating more time. The bottom right corner is an investor. Investor is your money works for you. And the thing about that is, that's where the rich people live. When you are, if you wanna be rich, if you wanna be wealthy, if you wanna change your life and future generations, you need to be here, have to be. It's not even an option. So with very rare exceptions, like you know, if you're a movie star, maybe you could be an you know, employee. Okay, there are very few people that fall into that category. Sports stars, like I understand that there are people that are there. With all due respect, we're probably not in that group. Investors where we need to be if we want to change generations to come and if we want to change our lives forever. So why is that so important? Well, if you break down the income statements of people that are, this is a poor income statement, and, and universally, people that are poor, they have a job, they get a salary from that job, that salary pays for their expenses, taxes, rent, food, transportation, clothes, whatever is left over, that goes to you know, potential savings maybe. Well, the biggest problem with that is, what happens if you break your leg? What happens? Because now you can't go to work. If you're, you know, if you're a landscaper you know, working on a crew, like you broke your leg, you're out of work. Well, now you have a dramatic problem that causes all sorts of debt and everything else that goes on in your life. What about if the market turns? Like, you know, right now we're having, you know, potential recessionary period. Well, if we have a recessionary period, people are getting let go. You could read Inman, you could read, you know, The Real Deal, you could read The Wall Street Journal. All of them are talking nonstop about the fact that, you know, people are getting let go left and right. Just yesterday, us, anywhere, our brands, they came out with an article, 11% of, you know, of the, the population in the last year has been let go. <clears throat> That's not a fun statistic to talk about, but it's true. We're in a downturning market. It just happens that way. So what happens is like when you're in that category of, you know, job, salary, expenses, and then whatever's left over is what I walk away with. Essentially, you're vulnerable. You're in a vulnerable position. The middle class are a little bit different. The middle class, they have a job, it gets paid a salary, and then it scoops around to liabilities because they go out there and they buy a home and they have credit card debt and they have student loans and you know, car loans and all of those different things. And it, it kind of like means that they have something. They have something that they're holding on to. And therefore, they're a little bit above, let's call it like, you know, like the, the poor because they have a home. You know, there's, there's a difference there in terms of what that looks like. The problem with the middle class in America right now is they're strapped with debt, completely strapped with debt. Many of us in this room are probably strapped with debt and it's not a good feeling. And part of the reason we're strapped with debt is, and I'm using this from Fight Club, but we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. It's true, it's very true. And the problem is, is like, if there's one thing that I learned from my parents and this is what they did really well is save. Like, so that's part of this equation. Now, what happens with the rich? The rich, forget about their job. Forget about the, the salary that comes in. They start building assets. And eventually, and by the way, I understand that people don't get from this slide to the next slide overnight. So I don't expect all of us to wake up rich tomorrow and be like, I did it. That's not gonna happen. 
It takes time to get to this. But how many of you guys are thinking about saying, you know what? I need to start getting assets because if I start getting assets, those assets will eventually take care of me later in life. Income comes from assets. That's what a balance sheet looks like for rich people. If you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. Warren Buffett. And it's the God's honest truth. It's the truth. How many people, you don't have to put your hands up, but how many people could go to sleep at night and have money rolling in? Not a lot, not a lot. I know I do, and I'm not trying to be egotistical when I say that, but I'm, I'm hoping that I push you in that direction as well. I wake up in the morning and I have like cha-ching, 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 all different you know, income that's come in from rental properties. So we're gonna get into that. How does that happen? Well, first of all, this young 21 year old decides to get into real estate. I get into real estate and one of the driving factors behind me getting into real estate is the thought process of, I'm not taking the freaking George Washington Bridge. It's not happening. I don't want that. I'm not waking up at 5.30 in the morning. I got better things to do with my life. No way. Now, I had the work ethic that my father had. I would bust my ass. Anybody who knows me knows I work 24 seven. I do, but I will not be in that category. Like I'm doing it on my terms and I didn't want that life. I didn't want to trade time for money. So I get into real estate, which is like the most entrepreneurial business I could think of. And by the way, the thing that I love about real estate is we're not, it's not pharmaceutical sales. We're, you know, it's not finance, like it's, and there's no disrespect to those two industries, but I really believe in home ownership. I believe in that American dream. I believe that that's like such a good thing for society. So for me, real estate is, is it. <clears throat> and I start learning some things and I learn why to invest in real estate. And we talk about this. We should talk about this with our clients. If we're not, we're doing them a disservice. But when you start talking about why invest in real estate, you have to understand why real estate first. So let's say you have hundred thousand dollars to invest. You take that hundred thousand dollars. You have some options. You can put it in the bank. You can put it into the stock market. You could go out and buy a home. Why would you choose one versus the other? So the answer to that question is let's first look at each option. Banking, the average saving account pays 0.3%. That's across the country. Pulled this yesterday. So these are real stats. That's approximately, excuse me. It's approximately 3% on the high side. So if you have hundred thousand dollars on the low side, you're going to make $300 a year with your money in the bank. Yeah, it's really safe. There's no risk attached to it. But the reality is you're not making any money. You're making $300 a year on a hundred thousand dollar investment. It makes no sense. So the next option is if you got a high end, you go get a, you know, a, an account that yields a higher amount. You're talking about $3,000 a year. I mean, how, how much money do you need to put in a bank in order to live off of the interest? A lot. Most people don't have millions of dollars to put in the bank to live off the interest. So that's not an option. Savings bonds, 5.33%, 5.33%. That's the hundred year average. So if you look at that, like that's $5,000 a year. You need a lot of freaking money to put your money in the bank and live off of it. That's not an option. The next option, stock market. So you put your money into the stock market. S and P 500, statistically speaking, outperforms any other thing on the stock market period. It also, it's, this is kind of funny, but it also outperforms all stockbrokers. And it's statistically proven that if you use a stockbroker, you will make less money than the S&P 500. So if you just put your money in the S&P 500 index, you're basically gonna get a return of 10.7% over the last 30 years. So off of that $100,000, you're walking away with $10,000 a year. It's better. Certainly a better use of your money than, you know, than the other options. If you're going to put your money somewhere, don't put it into the bank. Like, you know, you got to have some money for a security blanket, but that's not where you want to put your money. This is a better alternative and this is as safe as they come. Although I wouldn't say it's safe in the short term. You know, you could put your money in today. It could be less tomorrow. It could be more the next day. Like there's going to be movement. There's volatility to the stock market. Let's pause here for a second. It's very clear that Wall Street is better than the bank, period. It's also clear that the bank is better than buying a designer purse. <laughs> is that literally the purse you're holding? I love it. <laughs> they have appreciation value. 
We're going to talk about what constitutes an asset in a little bit. So here's the thing. Like, if, if, you, if you do really well in your life and you want to splurge on a designer purse, go to work. I'm not making fun of purses. I mean, there are things that I, I love to go on vacation, as you saw from the last presentation. But the reality is, is like, if you're talking about where to put your money, it's better to not spend it and put it into an asset than it is to you know, go out and go crazy. Um, especially if you're living above your means. To this point, for those of you guys who don't know this, Coldwell Banker is the only real estate company that I'm aware that will set you up with a SEP IRA. SEP IRA is a 401k for independent contractors. So anybody in this room who has not done this, you really should consider it. And I'm gonna talk a whole lot about real estate investment, but the thing about a SEP IRA is that it pulls the money from your paychecks and puts it towards your retirement savings before you touch it. Crucial, because you're not going out and buying a purse. Like, and it also is tax deferred. You're not getting taxed on that money because it's pulling it out. Very, very smart thing to do. I would strongly suggest you consider it if you haven't done it already. Sales pitch over. All right, why is real estate king? How much have New Jersey homes appreciated in the last 30 years? By the way, why did I take 30 years? Very simply, a mortgage is 30 years for the most part. So you're paying for something for 30 years. What is that asset going to be at the end of those 30 years? I don't need you to guess, we don't have a lot of time. 243%, that's real numbers this year. If you go back 30 years from ago to today, your average home doubled almost two and a half times has gone up in 30 years. That's 8.1% a year. Now for those who are really good at math, playing at home, 8.1% is less than the stock market at 10.7%. So here's the deal. There's a catch to that. There's a big catch. Breaking news, Wall Street outperforms real estate. Definitely not. Not even close. Why? Number one, leverage. When you go out and you spend $100,000 and you put it in the bank, you get $100,000 in the bank. And yeah, there's compound interest. I understand how that works. But it's 100 to 100. When you put it in Wall Street, it's 100 to 100 unless you're a nut and you're buying on margin. But like for the most part, like it's 100 to 100. When you go out and you buy a house, it's 100 to 500. You're getting a mortgage, that's 20% down. Could even be more extreme than that if you put less down. So now your $100,000 in either of these is the same amount of money. In real estate, it's not. You've just quadrupled it. Why? Because of a loan application. So that 8.1% is a year, but it's on leveraged money. It's 8.1% of 500,000, not 8.1% of 100,000. So it blows those other categories out of the water, just that alone, and I'm not even close to done. The next thing is number two. How do you make money on stock? Everybody in here probably understands this to some extent. You make money on stock in two ways. You sell that stock or you get a dividend. It's pretty much the ways you make money on stocks. So a dividend, we'll get to that, is on average, I looked all these stats up, on average dividends pays out somewhere between two and 5%. Why? They're trying to keep up with inflation. So people that own their stock, for the most part, you know, I realize we're in a crazy inflationary period, but for the most part, that kind of accounts for inflation, that's what they're looking for, so it can help people pay their bills. When you sell a stock, what happens? That stock goes away. You don't own an asset anymore. It's gone forever. Now you get money in return, but you also have to pay taxes on that return. So major, major difference between the stock market and real estate, why? Right now, taxes, you're paying somewhere between 10 and 37%, depending on which tax bracket you're in. And basically, you've now bought a stock, you sold that stock, you made a return, but you're also paying a percentage of that back. So that 10.7% return you made is getting reduced. And if, you, if it doesn't get reduced, that means you didn't sell. So you're not getting the benefit taking that money home with you. How do you make money on real estate? This is, uh, for those of you who don't know, this is like the daily double. Like this is the, probably one of the most important points that you could consider in working with investors and being an investor yourself are this series of slides. So there's appreciation. There's equity buildup. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about all these in a second. So there's appreciation, there's equity buildup, there's interest deduction, there's cash flow, and then finally, there's depreciation of an asset. So 
There are five ways to make money off of a real estate investment. There's also another bonus one that I'm going to talk about. Appreciation. We've already identified that on average in New Jersey, that's 8.1% a year. Equity buildup. I just took a, basically I took a, um, what do you call it? Uh, I don't know why I'm blanking out on the name. A schedule, I, don't, I'm, I apologize, an amortization schedule. I took an amortization schedule for a $500,000 house, down payment of 100 grand, you know, the loan amount's 400 with a rate of 6%. You look at this, when you talk about equity buildup, every single month, this is what I was talking about with my parents, every single month they paid their mortgage, they were paying themselves every month because all of the, the, uh, the principal that you're paying off you own a little bit more of the asset, a little bit more of the asset, a little bit more of the asset. Interest deduction is what you're paying the bank. <clears throat> now you're paying the bank and all of that you get to write off. Now I realize they change tax laws. You get a percentage of it where you used to get the whole thing. What is it? $10,000, something like that. So it's a little different depending on where you live. That could be you know, better or worse. But what I will tell you is, you know, if you look at it from the perspective of being able to write off even the expense, you're writing, you're getting what you're getting the equity buildup, you're getting the amount you're paying, you're also getting the amount that you're not receiving, at least in the form of a write off for your taxes. Cash flow, you get rent. That's what cash flow is. If you rent that building out, and I realize we're talking about investments, so if you're living in the building, you're not getting this, you know, but cash flow is the rent that you're getting. Now you're paying, you're taking that rent, you're paying the bills and whatever's left over. That's cash flow. That's positive cash flow to be specific. Depreciation of the asset. Clearly, I'm not an accountant, but what I will tell you, and go see your accountant, but there are two ways to depreciate an asset. Depreciation of an asset means the government defines that every home, residential specifically, has a 27 and a half year like, uh, salvage life. That salvage life means they feel like over time that home is gonna you know, depreciate and you're able to write that depreciation off. They changed the law in January of this year a little bit, but for the purposes of what I'm saying, this holds true. There used to be like bonus depreciation. I'm hoping that they reinstate that, but we're not gonna get down that, go down that road. Um, so here's the, the, the thing. These three at the bottom, the ones that are in green, those, you get the benefit of that whether you sell the asset or not, God bless you. You're still getting the interest deduction. You still own the asset. You're getting interest deduction. You're getting the cash flows that come off of it. You still own it. So, you know, think of like a dividend with stock. You're still picking that up. Depreciation of the asset. You still get that every single time. You still own the asset. Nothing's changed there. The top two typically are triggered by a sale, but not necessarily. And here's that bonus one that I was talking about. Number three is a cash out refinance. Cash out refinance means, let's say you own, you know, a, you own a home and it's a $500,000 property, the example I'm giving, and then it does two and a half times, let's just make it two times to make the math easy, it's a million dollars. Well, now it's worth a million dollars after 10 years, you can now pull money out of that asset through a cash out refinance and you still own the asset, but now you're getting cash out of it and you're just increasing your loans. Now. Why would you do that? Well, why you would do that is, first of all, it's a type of refinancing in which the borrower converts home equity into cash. You now have your cash, you also have your asset. I would do it because now I would take that cash and buy another asset, and I'm gonna talk about that. So when you sell a stock, what happens? You lose all of that money. When you sell you know, real estate, or excuse me, when you own real estate, you're still getting, a, you could do a cash out refi. Here's the craziest part about a cash out refi. It's your money. You're not borrowing it from anybody. You're borrowing it technically from the bank, but the reality is, is it's in your house, like it's your money. So it's tax-free, it's, it's a non-taxable event. So if you go out there and you own real estate for 30 years and then you put a mortgage on it and you pull a million dollars out of that house, you now have a million dollars, you have an asset, and the government's not taking a penny from you because it's technically your money. It's such a big difference between that and a stock. You can't do that with a stock. Number four, inflation. We're going through some of the worst inflation we've seen you know, in my lifetime, like, except for when I was really little. So you know, the reality is, is like inflation is the price of bananas is more expensive. The price of gas is more expensive. That's why the Fed is going crazy with interest rates, trying to make this inflation go down. Guess what's also more expensive? Rent. When everybody's bills go up, what do landlords do? They raise the rent. 
because they're like, I got to pay for more of this other stuff. So everybody's rent is going up right now. And why do I tell you that? Because if you own real estate, it's the best hedge against inflation that you're ever going to get. When everything goes up, the rents go up. So now your asset is, is you know, more lucrative than it ever was. And it's in keeping with inflation always. So you never have to worry about inflation. It's an easy thing to like pay attention to. If you put it in the stock market, the stock market gets killed because people stop buying goods and services. We don't get killed in that period. Real estate goes up. The price of inaction is far greater than the cost of making a mistake. This is the epitome of what I did. So I'm in real estate for eight years and I didn't buy anything, nothing. I was teaching people how to do this. And by the way, it was when the market crashed. So people were giving away houses. So clearly I'm not that smart, or at least I'm not a fast learner. But what I will tell you is I did learn over time. Part three, I walked into years ago, I, I was honored with the uh, National Association of Realtors 30 Under 30 Award. Awesome award. Most importantly, I, and people have heard me talk about this a million times because it's such a big part of like my day to day because I rely on that, that group of people all the time to bounce ideas off of and learn from. So I wind up, you know, I, I, I go to this event. They have a mastermind session they do every year. I walk into the event and this is from Neil Armstrong. That was a great quote. I didn't feel like a giant. I felt very, very small. If you don't know me, I'm as confident as they come. I am, I am like beaming with confidence on a normal basis. In that room, I felt like I accomplished nothing. Absolutely nothing. I mean, I was 30, 31, whatever it was. And, you know, I felt like I, I was, my business was like killing it. I was doing really well. You know, I was winning all sorts of awards. I won this award. It was such a big award to win national. And I walked into that room and these people were like, just head and heels beyond what I was doing. They were, you know, they were investing in businesses. They were investing in homes. They owned all sorts of properties. They did like they owned brokerages, some of them. Like, and I was looking around the room and I'm like, I might be the, the worst person here, like in terms of my accomplishments, like no doubt. And so, you know, I, I guess the, the best way to explain to you is we all feel vulnerable at a certain point in time. That was definitely my point of vulnerability. Like I felt like I need to do something. And there was a, a guy that got up. I love, I, to this day, he changed my world. His name is Bo Mankito. Bo Mankiti, excuse me. So Bo got up. He had a hundred million dollar real estate portfolio and he owned businesses and he was a 30 under 30, just like me. And he got up and he started speaking and he just like blew my mind. Excuse me one second. He made it so simple. It was a simple equation. It was spend less than you make and invest the difference wisely. And it was that last part that I think, I understood the first part because my parents were savers. I didn't understand the second part, but he got me to think differently about it. <clears throat> and there was other influences. I had a, a roommate that I, when I was in Italy that um, you know, his, he owned brokerages and he owned investment properties and him, you know, he's the one who got me into real estate if I'm being honest. And like, I saw what real estate investment was doing for him. And I realized like, this is, this is crucial. Like I got to do this. So I'm eight years into real estate and I finally buy my first house. Like some of you guys have been however long you're in real estate and maybe you don't own a home. Maybe you do, but I bought my first primary residence. It took me eight years before I even got to that point. I bought it. This was my house, dinky little house. I love this house, by the way. Um, <clears throat> four bedroom, two full bath. I bought it for 415,000 was the purchase price. I put down $82,000 and I'm going to tell you right now, it was not a steal. It wasn't, it was okay for the marketplace. I bought on a really great street. The house needed everything. And I just felt like, you know what? Like this is where I want to live. And it kind of checks enough of the boxes. And I'm, you know, I say buyers are liars. Well, buyers aren't liars because I was like, I'm never buying a buy level. I hate those style homes. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I bought a buy level, um, of course. Um, bought that house. That was 10 years ago. Almost 10 years ago to the day, right, in that, right around there. Well, that's not true. A few months off. So 10 years ago, 
And that was the first house that I bought. It took me eight years to buy my first one since being in real estate and knowing all the stuff that I had just talked to you about. Today, I own eight properties. I own 11 homes and 50 doors, which is like rentable units. And I'm gonna tell you right now, that is skyrocketing by the minute. Like that is going to continue to rise and rise and rise because I've gotten to the point now where there's enough passive income coming off of these other units that I could buy one to two, three, four houses a year. And guess what? It duplicates after that. So like my point is, is like, I always think about like in the back of my mind, the, the, uh, the four minute mile, like there, it took like 40 years or whatever it was for somebody to, to hit the 40 minute, mi- the four minute mile. And then the next person did it like five minutes later. And then like a bunch of people crossed that threshold because they like, you know, you learned it. For me, it was like, I needed to get started. And then I needed to learn certain lessons and I needed to make certain mistakes. And once I did that, it was like, all right, like it just like, you know, opened up from there. So how? I'm going to talk about some lessons and some things. Um, One, the way to get rich quickly is to do it slowly. Um, If it's too good to be true, don't trust it. I I don't believe in a get get rich quick scheme. That's not me. I don't do that. I think that you, what you need to do is you have to start somewhere. So start with one. Like, I mean, a lot of times people are like, how do you, like, you bought another house? Like my friends say that to me. And I don't even like, at this point, I don't even want to tell them. Like, I'm like, I don't even want to say I bought another house because I'm kind of like embarrassed because they still have one house or they're renting or whatever. And like, I, there's zero ego in it. It's just like what I do. And so, you know, when I, when I mention it, like, it, or it comes up in some other weird way, like they, it almost, they look at you like you're nuts. But like, the thing is, is like when they say to me, how do you even do this? What do you do? I start with one, just start. You got to start. So this one, let me talk about real stats off of this one. I told you 415 purchase price, $82,000 down, not a steal. You know what? The update is that house is worth 800,000. I did put money into it to like fix it up and stuff like that, but it's worth 800. It got appraised for that number. I was able to do a cash out refi, which I'm about to talk about. Um, about $385,000 in equity, 10 year stretch. So that's $38,500 a year on average that I'm, I'm making in equity um, and that, in appreciation, excuse me. And, and quite frankly, that could change. Markets go up, they go down. So take that with a grain of salt but I did $150,000 cash out refi on it. And why? Because I knew that that cash out refi, the way interest rates were, I was paying attention to this at the time, and the way interest rates were, that $150,000 cost me $200 a month, literally $200 a month. And so I was like, wait a second, for $2,400 a year, you're gonna give me $150,000? I'll take that bet, give me that money. I took that money and I put it into an investment that I knew damn well was going to get me at least $2,400 a month or $2,400 a year. In fact, it was like $2,400 a week. Like it was, you know, completely night and day. That's how you build. I've lived there for 10 years. I don't want this to be overlooked. When was the last time you lived in a stock? You don't live in stocks. Like you don't have any use of a stock. I got to live there without paying rent. I got all of the benefits that go, uh, you know, with interest and depreciation and all of that. Um, All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop for one second. It's one o'clock, and I am nowhere close to finished. (laughs) So I'm gonna give every person in here an option, and you will not offend me in the slightest bit. You can stay and listen to the rest of what I got to say, and I'm gonna do it for those who want to hear it or the next room behind us is where lunch is. And you're welcome to get up and eat lunch and you will not offend me at all, I promise. I told you one o'clock, so we're gonna stick to that, but I do wanna go through this because some people wanna hear it. Um, When you look at number two, if you wanna plant a forest, this is a really interesting lesson that I've learned. So if you wanna plant a forest, the thought, the concept on this is very simple. I had this idiotic idea, a lot of hungry people, I'm just messing with you. Um, We we basically, I had this stupid premise that I was going to pay these houses off. Like, uh, I'm, I'm gonna just pay as much as I can on this mortgage and I'm gonna get to be zero debt. Stupid. Like, why is it stupid? Because you're not leveraging your money, you might as well go buy stock. 
Like, what you're also doing when you think about it, if you want to plant a forest, is the concept of this. If you wanted to plant a forest, you wouldn't plant one tree, wait for it to grow up, and then plant another tree. No. That's like, you would plant a lot of seeds. You would do what you can to keep planting seeds. That is the concept of, you know, if you want to plant a forest, you have to start to try to get scale. You have to keep buying properties. So loans are crucially important. Don't try to do this through cash. Even if you have the cash, leverage your cash properly. It's a smarter move. <laughs> Number three, a lot of people talk about 1031 exchanges. A 1031 exchange is the ability to sell a property and not have a taxable event because you're taking the money that you got from that property and you're putting it towards another property. It's a, it's a crucial element to how business is done, especially in commercial real estate. So, you know, it's a really important thing. I'm not like, oh, like it's not a good thing. It's a great thing. It's not a good thing for me. Why? Because I buy and hold. That is my business. I buy and I hold. Now I'm gonna give you an extreme example of this, but it's a true example, and I hope that it helps you understand this. Positive cash flow is king for me. That's what I care about is positive cash flow. That's all I care about in an investment, more so than anything else, positive cash flow. The greater the positive cash flow, the better off it is. So when you think about it like this, I'm of the mindset personally, I'm not selling my real estate at any price. I don't sell it. And now I flipped houses. I'm not saying that I don't do any other investment, but for this book of business, for me, I don't want to sell this real estate. I don't care what you offer me. I'm not interested. I'm going to give you a real example. The house across the street from mine came on the market. I went for a run. I came back after running. It was like a five, six mile run. I came back and there was a freaking sign in the ground and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> like, and so, and I like it never even, like I, I passed this property 150 times, like, you know, in, in a month. And I like never even thought that I wanna buy this property until I saw the sign in the ground and I was like, I'm buying that house. So I wind up buying the house. Um, now, again, and I know some people are like, you know, think that, oh, you gotta find off-market properties and all that crap. No, there was a sign, there were multiple offers. It was not a steal. I bought the house, it was a four bedroom, two and a half bath, a little tiny cape. It's not a great house, but it has an awesome property. Um, 615 purchase price, $123,000 down, multiple offers, got the property. Literally reached out to my neighbor and I was like, listen, I'm going to close. Like, I don't care what happens, I will close. I want this house, let's figure this out. And he was like, write me an offer. <laughs> just like, so I was like in the mix, but eventually I did get it, so it all worked out. The rent on this house, now I'm gonna tell you, I did not buy this house as a rental, which is all the more reason why it's a great example. I wasn't even looking at positive cash flow on this house because I was thinking about the positive cash flow on the house that I was living in because I was moving across the street. And I bought the house with the premise that, eh, maybe I'll blow the back of it out, like, you know, just add to it, whatever. But this is a great property. It's a double lot. I want it. So I put this offer in. I buy the house. I close on it. And I realize I don't want to live there. Like, now it's going to sound ridiculous, but I... There's more to this story. I bought this particular house because I know that market like the back of my hand. I was one of the top agents in that marketplace for years. And what, what I realized is that that particular house was on a half an acre lot and there was nothing that sold in 15 years in that area, I did the research, for less than uh, $900,000. I bought it for six and change. So I figured it's subdividable. I was on the zoning board in time, you know, at a time. So I just had, I had another alternative, like, you know, uh, thought process here, but I scrapped all of that. And I was like, I'm just gonna keep it as a rental. You know, I'm just gonna keep it as a rental, hold on to it. So the rental price was $3,600. My fixed expenses were $3,500. I was making $100 a month. And keep in mind, I put $123,000 down. Dumb investment. Or is it? After two years, the tenants offered me $800,000. I was like, damn, 800 grand for this little house? Like, okay. And then I thought about it, I was like, nah, I'm good. I wanna keep it. <clears throat> so I kept it. The new tenants rented it for $4,600. This is two years later. So rental prices gone up. 
Now I rented it for 4,600. I refied because rates were great at the time. Now I got my cost down to 3,100, which means I was making $1,500 a month, $18,000 a year. This wasn't even supposed to be a rental property. It was a bad decision. It worked out. Is it always gonna work out? Of course not, don't make stupid decisions. But, but here's the crazy part. I got offered three times a million dollars for this house. Now, anybody knows anything about this marketplace would have been like, sell this house. What are you doing? I don't want to sell that house because honestly, like I'm looking at it. I'm like, yeah, a million dollars would be awesome right now, but I'm going to pay a crazy amount in taxes. And like, yeah, I'm going to have that money and I can reinvest it. And I understand all the angles to it. I get it. But the million dollars doesn't do it for me right this second, because that's not my goal. That's not my end game. What I want to do is this positive cash flow. I get $18,000 cash flow, $123,000 down. I'm making a 15% return on my money. That's better than Wall Street. <clears throat> I didn't, it wasn't even a good rental. It's better than Wall Street. And here's the crazy part. Where are rents going? Is this investment going to become better or worse long term? It's getting better every year. Every single year it's going up because rental prices aren't going down anytime soon. They're going up. My fixed costs for the next 30 years are the same. <clears throat> Number four, <clears throat> choosing the investment. I get more questions on this than anything in life. How do I choose the investment? Which one do I do? Where do I put my money? That kind of crap. I think the question becomes that of goals and risks. So I really am of the mindset investing is not gambling. And if, it's, if you're making investing gambling, you're screwing it up. It's not gambling, it's strategic. And there are things that you could think about to make it strategic for yourselves. I am never going all in. I'm not that type of an investor. I'm not like, oh, I gotta get this house so badly. I am going to risk everything to get this house. That is not me. I am so risk averse, it's not even funny. So for me, like that whole concept of like, if this is a problem, I'm going to go bankrupt or I'm not gonna be able to feed my kids their food. Like that's never going to happen to me because I don't operate that way. I'm going to use this example. And this is the reason why I never go all in. I bought a bed and breakfast down in uh, Ocean Grove. It's like right across the walking bridge from Asbury Park. Awesome spot. That bed and breakfast, when I bought it, it literally was like, we bought it. We did all sorts of like, we started to like do construction. We were doing construction on this project and like right in the middle of construction, COVID. And I was like, oh my God, like, you know, I was, uh, do we rent it annually? Like, what do I do? I don't know. And then like, we start doing construction, we're finishing it and whatnot. And we made a, a, a rent, like in renovating it, we got a permit for um, P tax is what they're called. They're like, uh, you know, air conditioning and heating units on the side of the house and all that stuff. We spent $15,000 installing these P tax. And we didn't realize that in Ocean Grove, a permit is not good enough. You need a permit, plus you need approval from the Historical Preservation Committee. And we put holes through historical sheathing, which was awesome. So I basically walked in front of the firing squad, known as the HPC, and I'm like, oh, I was on a zoning board. I know how to handle this. Yeah, right. They basically threw tomatoes at my head. And I mean, to the point that it, they were like, get out and fix this. It was 15 grand, like this, gone. Like if I was all in, I would have been screwed. Like I wouldn't even have known what to do, but I wasn't all in. And I'm just telling you, like, don't put yourself in that position. It's not worth it. Things are going to go wrong. Those mistakes will, you'll learn something along the way. Believe me, I'm better for those mistakes that happen. This is another one that I bought in Ocean Grove. This is a 17 uh, unit uh, apartment building. So this one, <laughs> I bought this property and I had a partner on this. And the partner says to me, uh, I got the lending down. Don't worry about it. Like I'm in real estate. My partner's not in real estate. And I, I was like, Oh, you got it. Oh yeah. My father knows this guy. Like we're good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> How I fell for this dumb decision. I don't even know, but who his friend was, was a mortgage broker. And we get to the closing table and the guy's looking for $15,000, give or take. And I'm like, I can't believe this happened again. Like another 15,000 out the window. Things are gonna go wrong. I'm just using that as an example, but like things will go wrong. You're gonna make mistakes. Hopefully you don't make the same mistakes twice. The appreciation of 8.1% a year. 
that to me is cake. That's the extra. I'm not banking. I'm not investing based on appreciation. I'm not speculative. I'm not looking at an investment and saying to myself, like, see that investment over, see that town over there? I think it's gonna crush it for years to come. So I don't care about passive income. All I care about is like investing in that house. Never, never. Like for me, it's like, what do the numbers say? Is it going to cash flow today? If it cash flows today, I feel very comfortable that it's gonna cash flow in the future. Rate of return is what I look at. Specifically, cash on cash rate of return. All of these people that talk about cap rate and all this other stuff, it's stupidity to me. Cash on cash return is a very simple equation. You don't even have to look at the equation, you'll understand it. When I put up $100,000 right now, what am I getting back in year one? How much cash is coming back to me at the end of the year after I pay all my expenses? When you look at cap rate and some of these other things, it doesn't account for expenses, it doesn't account for those things. This does, cash on cash return is king. It's, I spend 100, how much do I get back? Now the question that always follows this and every time I talk about investment is, well, what's a great, what's a great cash on cash return? It's hard to say that because it depends on what you're trying to invest in in terms of real estate. What I will tell you is I have several investments that are over 50%. Like literally, and now think about that, like I have a 30 year mortgage, a 30 year mortgage and I made my money back in two years or less than two years. Like those are great investments. I'll take that all day long over the stock market. <clears throat> I'm so sorry my voice is shot. Where do I find my properties? Most of the houses I bought were the MLS. <clears throat> so when you talk about, oh, I need to find off market. No, you don't. Like, believe me, there's plenty of opportunity out there. You just have to be smart and look for it. I believe very firmly in adding value. And so there are different ways to add value. And I will never go out and buy, some people do it, God bless them. I'm not going out and buying like, you know, a brand flip. Like why? They're making the money off of that, not me. Like I'm gonna add value. So renovations is one easy way to add value. If I could renovate and I could change things around and be creative on how I'm using space, awesome, all the better. Next thing is marketing. <clears throat> when I bought that bed and breakfast, I realized he sucked at marketing. He like literally had like a crooked sign on the front of the building. The pictures looked like they were selling antique furniture. Like when I started to look through it, I realized like, why is he, he like, I wouldn't want to stay there for one night. Like, of course his business model and his, you know, his return looks the way it does. The second I got in there, I got professional pictures done. We cleaned the whole place up. We made it shine online. It's what we all do for real estate. <clears throat> we made it shine online. And then magically we did two and a half times the revenue that he did for 25 years in owning, owning the building. We did it in the first year. Why? Because marketing is a part of it. You gotta add your value. Next thing is just being creative and thinking about things differently. Use is a big part of this, especially when you get into commercial properties, obviously. Like understanding that your use and what, what your allowances are. Are you allowed to do transient rentals? Better, like think of like uh, Airbnb. <clears throat> are you allowed to change a space from residential to commercial? If you start getting into the uses of a, of a particular building, people might not get creative. The last owner might never even thought of it. And now all of a sudden you created this use and that use has a much greater return than the use that it was currently used as. This is a building that I bought in upstate New York by Gore Mountain, it's in North Creek specifically. So really cool building, you know, 100 plus year old building. And <clears throat> they got terrible commercial rents. The first floor was a commercial space. So the two top levels were residential. You got great rents for residential because people go up there for all sorts of reasons. They go up there to ski. They go up there to like look at the foliage. They go up there, believe it or not, for uh, they have some of the best whitewater rafting in the country because it comes right off of Gore and it goes right into the Hudson. So you have all of these different things, these reasons why people rent residentially. We were stuck with a downstairs who residentially we might get 1,500, 2,000, maybe even more, $3,000 a month. On the downstairs, we were getting, the guy was renting it forever. They had a whole rent roll, excuse me, the woman. She was renting it forever. And 
I mean, her rents were like $500 a month for like an antique store or like, you know, some type of like law firm or whatever. And I realized like, this is terrible. So we started talking about it and we said, you know what? Why don't we create an entertainment space for the rentals that we had up there? And we're going to rent out the entertainment space to all the people that are renting in the area. So what do we do? We put in pool table. We put in like a whole like entertainment, a bar section. We put in, um, what's it called? Uh, video games, like, you know, stand up video games. We put in all sorts of stuff. People go up there with their kids. There's nothing to do in North Creek. You go skiing. What do you do at night with your kids? You sit in a hotel room? No, you rent out our space. The town loved it. It's like, you know, giving them a little bit more life. And we like took a five, $600 a month rental. And now all of a sudden we're getting thousands of dollars a month because people are like, I love this space. This is great. Called it the clubhouse marketing. Number five, I don't own one of these <laughs> and I'm not planning on it. Maybe way later in life. <clears throat> I, uh, I dated this girl years ago in college and her father was, um, was on the board of directors of KPMG, one of the largest accounting firms in the country and in the world. And he was a senior partner, smart man. And I remember we went at one point, I, I had dated him for like, you know, several months. And we went, uh, we had dated her, excuse me. <laughs> I had dated her for several months. And I went to, uh, you know, I had I'd gotten to know him and he had this car and we went, we, you know, to go pick up. He goes, can you, can you run a favor for me? I said, yeah, what do you need? He goes, I need to go pick up my car. I go, what do you mean? That, that's your car. He was like, no. He was like, that's not my car. He goes, that's my other car. And he goes, I got to go pick up that car. And I go, okay. And it was a seven series Beamer. It was beautiful. And I remember being like, oohs and ahs over this car. And I'm not really a car guy, but it really was a nice car. And he goes, Mike, can I teach you something? He's like, you're with my daughter. He's like, you know, you seem like a smart guy. And he goes, don't buy toys. And I looked at him and I'm like, isn't this your seven series? And he was like, yeah, but I'm at a different part in my life. He said, buy assets, don't buy toys. He goes, later, those assets will pay for your toys. Don't buy toys. That's a toy. That's not an asset. I don't care how beautiful it is. I don't care how many people turn around and look at you when you drive it. That is not an asset. I still live in this little dinky house. I could easily afford most of the houses in town, probably all of them, with very little exception. I don't live in any of those houses. I live in this house because I don't need it. Well, now I do, but <laughs> I mean, and ultimately we are going to buy a bigger house, but like, I just didn't need a whole lot. And quite frankly, I bought that house. Like my wife's a teacher. We bought it on her salary. It wasn't even accounting for my salary because I knew I wanted to invest in real estate. Positive cash flow is everything. So I also work for Coldwell Banker, if you hadn't noticed. And I get an income from Coldwell Banker. That's my job. And that job like helps me pay bills and stuff like that. But my assets and my job together help me buy more assets. That's where I spend my money. And it doesn't mean that I don't go on nice vacations. It doesn't mean that I don't eat well. I do other things, don't get me wrong. But like the whole goal is, you know, you buy assets, those assets buy more assets. In, the, in terms of this, that's the equation. Incomes comes from assets, use income to buy more assets. It snowballs. I don't spend any money that I make off of any of these real estate investments on anything other than real estate investments. That's it. I make money off of, you know, rent check comes in, I put it in an account, I build up enough money in that account, I go buy a house. I buy another investment building. Like, that's, that is the formula. I just stick to it over and over and over again. It's a slow race. You're not going to get there next year, but I'm just going to use myself as an example. And it's a small example. I don't have like this real estate empire by any means, but when I think of like myself and I try to teach this to other people, like I went from having no real estate and having all this understanding of the real estate market to buying one house and then using it to propel all these other purchases to having over 50 rental units in the last 10 years. Like it's duplicatable. Like it's not this like hard thing. You just got to buy the right real estate. You got to hold on to it and you got to not be enticed by selling it to the person that comes along and gives you a good deal because it's like, you know, you got to be disciplined. I'm going to throw out a couple bonuses um, and then we're going to wrap up. <clears throat> and I really do appreciate you guys indulging me here. Um, so some lessons that I learned, I do have partnerships. Not every property that I own, I own outright. Strategic partners are a good thing. I'm going to use the bed and breakfast as an example. Do I look like I have time to operate a bed and breakfast? No, I don't. I have zero time. 
So I have, I have an operating partner who helps me run the bed and breakfast and he takes care of some of those things. Crucial. I could never get into that business if it wasn't for him because him and I together make a great team. I'm great at the marketing. I have a better balance sheet to go out and actually buy more real estate than he does. And together we figure it out. So crucial is you gotta have operating agreements that read properly. This is not one that you take lightly. You could screw yourself over by, by going into partnerships and not going to an attorney. You guys have questions about operating agreements? I am not an attorney, but I could try to help you as best I can. Uh, <clears throat> a little bit of a formula that I always try to, try to do when I refi a property, how do you figure out how much money to take out? Because I had more equity in some of these properties. I could have taken more out well, my formula was I'm not taking all my equity out because I don't want to screw myself up if I move out of this house or if rental prices go down in any way. Not that I think that they will, but like markets do shift. You know, you might get a, like a glut in the market at a certain time. So for me, it's a 25% margin. Like 75% is the reverse of that. You know, fixed expenses should be a maximum of 75% of rent. It's a very easy formula. You take your, you know, your fixed expenses, you figure out what rent is, you, you know, take 25% off of that, that's where your fixed expenses need to be. So that's what I would account for. Don't reach, I kind of alluded to this before, don't put yourself in a bad position, be smart about this. <clears throat> don't wait to buy real estate, this is a big one. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm gonna time the market. Oh, you are? Because like, if I knew how to time the market, I'd be a multimillionaire because everybody feels like they're gonna time the market. You're not timing the market. We have no idea what's gonna happen. <clears throat> this is a big one, I'm getting to the end. So the lens in which you see the world is gonna dictate what you see. This was such an important lesson for me to learn. I see the world for years and years and years, I've only saw the world through a like a positive cash flow perspective, buy and hold mentality. That is the way that I looked at investments because that was my strategy. I had one of my neighbors approach me a few years ago and say, hey Mike, <clears throat> I think I wanna sell my house, do you wanna buy it? He wanted $550,000 for that house. I went and looked at it and I was thinking, do I want it for you know, my wife, my family and all that stuff? I was like, no, I don't like the floor plan for us. And then I looked at it and I was like, let me look at the cash flows on it. And I looked at the cash flows and they just weren't there. And so I passed on it. What a dumb decision. It was the perfect flip. It was the perfect flip. But I wasn't even thinking about a flip. All I was thinking about was buy and hold. I had an off market property that he was gonna sell to me for a really good number in the marketplace. That house sold for 750. 750, I got stick to my stomach when I saw it sell. Like, because I was like, oh my God, that's $200,000 that I just gave away. Now I realize that there's money to like fix it up and all that stuff, but I would've got a really good return on that, but I was seeing the world through the wrong lens. Don't look at real estate through one lens. There are a lot of different lenses. There's a buy and hold lens, which I've been talking about, you know, cause that's my favorite. A, an offshoot of buy and hold is short-term rentals. You know, you have annual rentals, you have short-term rentals. I own both. I own multifamilies, I own single families, I own commercial buildings, I own a farm, I own all sorts of weird things. You know, bed and breakfast, hotels, I'm under contract on a bed and breakfast right now. Like, I love the short-term rental business, love it. I think it's a great business for me personally. It's not for everybody, it's a little bit more hands-on. Some people want an investment that's gonna be an annual thing. Those annual things, in many cases, have a lower return. That might be okay for you. You have to figure out what your returns are and what you're looking for. Flips, I obviously, you know, everybody knows what those are. Um, wholesale is another one. I don't particularly lo love wholesale personally, but there are instances where, you know, if, that, if I had bought that property for 500, 550, whatever, and I didn't really want to do the work to it, I could have probably found a buyer that would have paid me a lot more. You know, the one thing I'm going to tell you, and this is, this is not part of my presentation, this is just being real, I do not mix business and investment. I, like anybody who's in my office and has been for years, I have never once been like, oh, that's a good property. Let me try to buy that off market. I don't do that. Like I never, ever, ever cross that line. And for me personally, I would never cross that line with a client either. Like, so if I walk into a seller's house and they tell me like, hey, I want, you know, I want you to list my house. I wouldn't be like, oh, I'll buy it for that. I personally don't like that. Some people do it and that's fine if you do. 
within reason. You got to make sure it's, you know, you're doing it like above board. But to me, like when I approach an investment, like I'm not wearing my realtor hat. I'm an investor. Like I'm looking at this for me personally to each his own on that, but that's just who I am. Like, I just want to be able to sleep at night. I don't want my clients to think that I'm trying to work them to make money. That's just not how I operate. <clears throat> what are your goals? I think this is the biggest thing. And this is really where I'm going to end. I'll tell you where my goals are. <clears throat> it's a little sappy, but it's the God's honest truth. I have like two goals that I think about when I invest. These are my two goals and I'm not leaving my wife out of this, but I'm going to explain in a second. So <clears throat> the left side, my parents, my parents, like I said, they were dirt poor. They got themselves to middle class. I love that about them. I love what they've been able to do. I want to take that baton and take it here. I want to bring it to that next level, which brings me to the right side. <clears throat> the right side are my kids. If I flip a house today, my kids are probably not going to benefit from that money. Maybe, but usually it'll get spent in some weird way. Go out and buy a, you know, Louis Vuitton bag or something. <laughs> but the truth is, is like, usually that money is going to go. Like if I hold properties, they're getting them. And rental prices are going up because I was an economics major. Scarcity. There's only so much land to not print more land. And the population in this area just keeps growing and growing and growing. It's a population center. So that's going up. Land is staying the same. It means prices are rising. And they're going to continue rising forever. And when I hand those properties over to those girls, they're going to be in a position where the rental prices are going to be so much higher than what I could even envision today that it's, it's guaranteed to work. Like there's no question about it. And then they can live the lives that they really want to live. That's it. <laughs> um, I apologize to all you guys for running late. I do appreciate your patience. The next one we're going to do is February 15th. I will push out a link on that. Lining up the speakers is the only reason why I didn't put a link out. We do have lunch in the room behind us. And thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it.